get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, P90X, Quest Nutrition, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry. Uh, This past year, we hosted events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Vegas. I'm sure I'm missing a few. So if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate and to get your business to the next level, go to Rise25, contact us and ask us where our next event is going to be. And I want to do a special thank you, shout out to Azrael Ratz, who hails all the way from Israel for introducing me to today's guests and Azrael helps companies find their ideal audience on Facebook and create more sales and uh, he can be found on Rats Pack Media, R-A-T-Z Pack Media.com. Today I'm very excited. We have the co-founders of Tenzo Tea, Steve O'Dell and Robbie Page. They run a matcha tea ba- company based in Santa Monica. Uh, Tenzo Matcha Green Tea, which is interesting guys, is grown in Kagoshima, Japan. So they're not getting it in like the local street corner in California. Um, Their products can be found at various coffee shops and smoothie facilities all over California and online at tenzot.co. And they cannot be found on Amazon, which we'll talk about. Um, But a fun fact, they both played volleyball at UCLA. Robbie, I was, watching, you know, I was reading up on both of them, but Robbie was named best server by the, by the Association of Volleyball Professionals and Pro Beach Volleyball Tour at one point. And we have 6'6", six, six, and Robbie is seven feet. You cannot tell by them sitting there, seven feet tall. So thanks for joining me, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. So I want to get into Tenzo T and the benefits and how you guys started this, but I want to go back to how you guys met and sure. the, go back to the roots for a second. Yeah. So I met Steve. First time I saw this guy was in Rochester, New York. It was my first ever volleyball practice. I showed up to practice and his older brother was my coach. How old were you I, at the time? I was 14 years old. This guy was 12. He's two years younger. So um, how I tall were you at, at 14 and 12? He was 6'4 with a 4-inch blonde afro. 6'4 at 14? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And you were – how tall were you at the time? I was only 5'5". Like five, five. I was like – I sprouted wow. up like freshman year of high school. Okay. So sorry, Robbie. Go ahead. I just had to yeah. – I have to get your journey of height, your yeah. growth also. Growth as a company and growth as a person. So. A great, a great yeah. time to follow. Yeah. But uh, uh, so I met Steve. He was just this crazy, got a little twelve-year-old who ran the court. He'd been playing volleyball for like eight years at that point. Knew everyone in the gym. Came over, introduced himself with a squeaky voice. Hey, what's up, man? I'm Steve. You know, like twelve-year-old <laughs> Steve. And I was just like, who is this guy? You know, but I knew he was a special person right from the get-go. Um, and that really, that whole like that day changed my life in a lot of ways. I got into volleyball. It really changed my course of course of history for me. And then, so Rob and I played volleyball together in high school. Um, Rob continued to grow, um, and then we, he went to UCLA. Two years later, I followed him there, and we played for the Bruins um, under a great coach. And then... So go Rob- back for a second. So you're recruited by UCLA. You could probably go to a lot of places. Where else are you considering Robbie at the time? And then, Steve, so Robbie, you go off to UCLA. Where else are you considering? Great question. So uh, volleyball, the best volleyball in the world... Not in the world, other in the countries in Southern California. There's a lot of amazing schools like UCLA, USC, Stanford's also great. On the East Coast, probably the best school is Penn State. Mm. So I was talking to a lot of colleges. Penn State was probably my number two. Um, and I went out and I got a really great offer to play for the Bruins. And I was like, honestly, it was like a dream come true. So I accepted that. And then we were playing. I was playing two years. And Steve was coming through the ranks, dominating in high school volleyball. And he was looking at a lot of places as well. Like, very similar situation, um, a bunch of West Coast schools, Penn State, 
three of my older brothers played at Penn State. So really, yeah, I kind of grew up um, in the gym uh, with the Nittany Lions, but opted to kind of pay my own course and go to UCLA as well. It was really special as well because no one from Rochester, New York, especially the East Coast, had ever yeah. got a scholarship to go to UCLA. And we had two in the same gym in the same time period. So it was really... That's cool. bizarre, actually. And I was doing the research. I just had assumed, since you guys were in Santa Monica, that you both were based in California. And then I you know, saw you went to UCLA, did volleyball. I was shocked, actually, that... You know, because they probably have so much talent in California that they rarely bring in people from out of state, I imagine. Um, right. So did you have any pull with that, Robbie, with Steve going there? or? I mean, I was talking, I, I always would go in and look at the coaches' recruiting board, you know, and you'd see their top recruiters and picks in the country and who they're looking at. And I was like, oh, that guy Steve, he's a special person. You should get him on the team. Like, we play well together. Yeah, yeah. it is a, a – Coaches like that too. So when you guys are both in college, what are you thinking you're going to do after? Are you thinking I'm going to go pro in volleyball? Are you thinking, you know, because obviously entrepreneurship, I know, uh, Steve, you were a history major. And Robbie, you were, I think, like neuroscience or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, for me, I was uh, studying life science. My parents were doctors, so I kind of grew up in the field. It came easy to me. I loved problem solving and physics and chemistry, and it's all great. I realized pretty quickly that I didn't want to go into medicine out of college, and I committed just to playing professional volleyball. So uh, I went and played a year professionally in Italy, first year out of school. That was awesome. I played two years in the beach professionally, and that was kind of the time frame between when Steve left school and then everything kind of joined after that. So, uh, Steve, I want to get to you in a second, but Robbie, so was there any thoughts of Olympics or anything else? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I played on a bunch of national teams all the way through my uh, through high school, through college. <clears throat> I was in a pipeline to shoot for 2020 or 2024 for beach. Mm. Um, I was playing with a lot of the best players in the country. Volleyball is an interesting sport because the average age in the Olympics is probably over 30 years old. Oh, really? Yeah, so it doesn't really your your body. There's a lot of longevity in like your body and your knees. The sand's good to you, so. People get really, really skilled after like 34 years old, 38 mm. years old. So it was kind of like in the pipeline, it was like invest the next 10 years of your life to someday hope and dream to play in the Olympics, you know? Right. It was really interesting for me because I, I realized I wanted to do something more right now. You know, I didn't want to wait and just kind of hang on this idea for 10 years. I still think I could go back someday and really compete and play if I gave like a solid four years of training, but we'll see where life goes. So do you, either of you still train and play? We play a little bit, uh, mainly just for fun, not super serious. I mean, you could have your own sponsorship with your own company. <laughs> Tenzo, just go pro just so you could wear the Tenzo T- <laughs> T-shirts and, and shorts. So I put my marketing mind down for a second. Like, forget about the pro thing. Like, just, you know, Tenzo T-sponsored uh, AVP. But... um. So, Robbie, or Steve, for you, you're a history major, right? So what are you thinking you're going to do? Oh, man. So I, first two years of school, I really had no idea. Um, probably something similar to Rob. We're like, oh, you always have coaching as a fallback. Do you want to go pro at the time? I mean, are you thinking? Um, I, don't, I didn't really think I was good enough. Um, maybe. But no, it wasn't very, like a very serious focus. Yeah. Um, but then I took this course at UCLA with uh, this professor named Steven Peterson called Entrepreneurial Communications. And I got like the highest score in the class, um, pretty much got 100, like 100% in the course. Um, and I really loved it. It was the first school class that I loved. Um, so I had a bad habit of not going to classes. And yeah. If I was a history major, I would not love it either, personally. But so <laughs> I was just not really into school and then took this class. Um, after the class, went home for summer vacation and started my first company with my cousins. Um, and we this is the Odd Job Bros. Company? Odd Job Bros. Yeah. Okay. After yeah. that, so what? Rest- tell me about that. So, because um, I feel like your journey after college, you started a number of companies, kind of that led you into Tenzo T. So, Odd Job Bros. You said just start a company. Most people yeah. aren't doing that right out of college, right? Um, what do you well, decide to do? Actually, what's that? Uh, I was still in school. Oh, you were in still in school. Okay. Yeah, so I was just home for the summer, and we had six weeks with my cousins, and my parents handed uh, Jimmy, 
who's one of my cousins, an application to Burger King and said, you guys need to get jobs. And so he told me this and I was like, hell no, let's meet at Starbucks tomorrow morning. We won't leave until we have a plan of how we're going to make money and grow a business. Um, so we all met at Starbucks. We actually wore full suits um, just to like show the seriousness. And then we sat there for five or six hours, came away with like three to four ideas. We're going to start volleyball clinics, sell t-shirts, do random jobs. Um, and then we ended up, we looked into the volleyball clinics. It was a little too expensive. Um, so we didn't have a lot of money. And um, the t-shirts were even too much. And so we put $120 into a printer and some paper uh, and designed flyers and then paid the mailman $10 more to distribute them mm. all over uh, kind of the local area. That's a good um, hack. Pay the mailman $10 yeah. or $20. But it is illegal. Um, <laughs> He used federal services. Well, it's illegal for him, probably not for you, right? Yeah. So he actually he got fired um, because of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh so, my gosh. Yeah. So that's that was pretty crazy. But <clears throat> um, the Audra Bros taught me like a, a lot of really important things about how to grow a company. Um, like we what? didn't do really any marketing after that. It was pretty much all word of mouth, um, and quality was our number one thing. So we would always guarantee 100% quality satisfaction with customers. Um, kind of like two really big lessons there. And um, I think made- you know a lot of times people leave out a rock solid guarantee. So what did you have at Oddjob? What was your guarantee to the that customers? They love our quality of work, um, and it'd be exactly what they wanted. So we were doing like gardening or moving and we'd ask like, is this exactly what you want to? Is there anything else we can do? We're happy to do it. Just let us know. Um, we want to make sure that we are a hundred percent good. Um, and every time if they needed somebody else, we would do it. Um, and then it's like, it's so easy. It seems so easy, but it makes most people don't do it. And it makes a huge difference. Um, cause then that person will tell another person and they'll tell another person and that chain kind of spirals out. So what was next? Odd job bros, and then you started another company. Went right back to school um, <clears throat> and did like a really short stunt. At, so I was like really like thinking of ideas at this point and did a short stunt with a moving company and did an on-demand printing company that was a little more serious. Um, so we were delivering papers like an Uber for printing all around campus. We did like three or 400 orders over the course of a few months and then kind of just realized that it, the market wasn't there and it w- didn't really make sense. And the big lesson with the printing company was that you want to kind of follow the way the world's working and like look at general trends and have those work in your favor rather than try to fight against that. Um, and so the world is moving towards digital. It doesn't make sense to start a printing company. And that's one of the ideas that we adopted uh, when we started Tenzo. And then going from that, I was selling portable chargers online with another great entrepreneur named Alejandro Rioja. Um, and we were doing a lot of sales mainly through SEO. That's when I got my first kind of dip in the e-commerce space. Um, mm. And one of the big lessons there was that we needed to win a new customer every single time because no one needs two portable chargers. Yeah. That's another. I just idea. bought two actually, but I bought one for someone else. Gosh. But yeah, yes. So <laughs> yeah, it's not consumable, right? So the Tensor T, like you, the, yeah, exactly. Lifetime value of a customer is probably a lot higher. Right. So that's kind of like a big thing that, so taking a lot of those old past experiences, working them into Tenzo is really, really valuable um, going forward. So Tenzo, where's the idea come from? A lot of things. Yeah. I kind of, I, I'm, I'm kind of a big believer in just like the intuition of life and kind of just like knowing what makes sense at the right time and recognizing opportunity. But um, summer of 2016, Steve has dropped out of UCLA at this point. I'm playing professional volleyball. Um, we're both like, actually, it was funny you mentioned the sponsorship thing. So I was like, oh man, it'd be so cool to have my own company to sponsor me, you know? And like, we're talking about building a business. What what could we do? We really wanted to provide a ton of value, and we wanted it to be like a new kind of opportunity so we can make for ourselves and we, we could win. Those are like our main three kind of categories we're looking for in a business. So. We started learning and reading, and Steve's a massive reader. He just reads all the time, so he got me hooked. And we just sat in a two-bedroom apartment, and I play a in the morning, and we just learn and grind and read the rest of the day, reading business books, marketing books. I was learning graphic design, um, photography, a lot of that kind of the realm of uh, the marketing and branding realm. And wanna Steve, when you tell me about the the decision to drop out. 
Yeah, I mean, it was <clears> – <throat> so Rob has this, like, funny story, but, like, I never, um, never, ever, ever liked to study for school – um, or, and I had a, I would literally never go to class and I would beat 90% of the kids in the class. Hmm. Um, and I like, I'd write papers very last minute and do fine. And, um, I was also like extremely invested in learning outside of this class. Um, so I, I like am obsessed with learning. Um, as so a, here, here's a funny story. So we're in the med school library. I'm studying all day for this massive, I think it was a physics or life science exam. Like ten hour library day. I'm more on your side, Robbie. That that's more my personality. But yes, I have yeah. to do you know for that kind of. Thing. <clears throat> so like we're studying. My friend Daniela Abrams, she's amazing too. We're working all day, and about five or six hours in, it's like probably about dinner time. I look over, and I'm like, Hey Steve, don't you have a final tomorrow? He's like, Yeah. I'm like, What are you reading? And he's like, Oh, this it's like a biography on some amazing individual. I've been reading all day long. I'm like, dude, like what are you when are you gonna start studying? He's like. Yeah, it's like a 9 a.m. exam. I'll probably open my books like seven or eight, see what I can do. <laughs> I'm like, what? I was this possible? But it was funny. It was like that's what like, he's just always is pursuing like outside knowledge. It's kind of the main theme there, you know, like generalizing, learning the bigger picture things. Which I think is really important. So your parents, Steve, what do they do? Were they entrepreneurs? No, no, no. My mom is a teacher, and my dad's a businessman. Um, they are both very conservative. And so I actually didn't tell them uh, that I dropped out. They still out. don't know. No, no they know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and um, flew back for like spring break, they thought, and uh, told them. I was like, hey, guys, got to tell you something. In the living room is a really terrible conversation. Um, but, you know, Tim Ferriss says, like, you can judge the quality of a man or woman by, their, by the amount of tough conversations they've had. So that was kind so of one of that. Was that a tough decision for you to drop out? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's a massive risk, um, and it was extremely uh, negative from an outside standpoint for a while, uh, meaning like all my friends didn't think that it would work. My parents didn't think it would work. Um, I didn't get to like walk the stage of graduation at UCLA. But all what my were friends- you? What were you? Were you at the time? Were you working on Tenzo, or like when you were when you dropped out? What were you working on? <laughs> I was learning how to program and reading. Um, like, yeah, like Rob said, I would. Li- I loved the, the library, and I would I'd just go in there all day and read and learn and test test stuff, break stuff. I was learning how to like, I was email scraping and kind of just doing like crazy entrepreneurial stuff. Um, really a lot with my buddy Alejandro, and then with Rob. So you were just figuring out what the next thing was. Yeah, exactly. You didn't know what it was. No, I mean, the kind of the. This might sound weird, but like really I just dropped out out of pure sheer belief in myself that I was going to do it uh, and make it work no matter what and there's nothing that can stop me. Yeah. And so do you then move back to New York or do you stay in California? No, I stayed in California. I moved in on uh, this guy's couch. And so (laughs) that's, you know – Stressful. I find it stressful. You you seem that you were maybe at peace with it. No, well, I mean it, it is extremely stressful. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean I really can't take like take for granted. Like Rob has given me a ton of support, um, and that's like an amazing, amazing thing and opportunity. Um, and it really wouldn't have been possible without that. And like, just giving the opportunity to learn those first six months was like really critical. Um, and. I mean, we I've never we have never been on this mission to like make a lot of money or try to become like world famous million like billionaires, you know? It's always been like we want to build a great company that lasts a long time that positively impacts a ton of people throughout the world. And so just kind of taking that time early to learn was really critical, even though it may seem like tough. And it was really hard. And I might seem at peace with it now, but like I had this crazy entrepreneurial schedule, so like I would go to bed at midnight and try to get up at 4 a.m. every single morning yeah. and then had my whole day structured of like two hours of programming, two hours of reading, two hours of business general, two more hours of programming, review for two hours, like just like that, like all day. And I, yeah, I was, tell me about the routine a little bit. So at this point, Robbie, you're playing professional volleyball. Yes. Okay. I was on the beach still. And so, Steve, you have this crazy regiment. Okay, how did you come up with that? No, I just I iterated on it. So I mean, 
That was like my third iteration of the ultimate entrepreneur regiment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading all these books and like Ben Franklin, the, all, all like the best guys in history. And I have like a whole other thing I could talk about that's kind of unrelated. But I was like studying influential people and people that I really admire. And the routine is really important for learning and fast paced learning and learning really, really well. Um, which is like a major mm. distinction in entrepreneurship and school. Yeah. Because uh, like I can't – everything that I do as an entrepreneur for Tenzo needs to be 100% accurate. Like there's no mm. there's no like, games. Like you don't get an A, a B, a C, a D, or a failure. You need to get A's. Like every single day you need to show up and get an A. Mm. So I had to like learn how to do that really well, really fast and efficiently. Yeah. You remind me of uh, a good friend of mine, Michael Simmons, who has a group that is talks about people who, how you can learn better. It's really interesting. You guys will get along. I'll have to introduce you at some point. Um, so talk about your top, like someone's thinking, this sounds great. I want to learn from some of the top minds too. Who are the top, like where should people start? Who are the top five? You mentioned Benjamin Franklin. Who are Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. Aristotle, Nietzsche, um, Alexander Hamilton. I think those are probably four guys you should definitely read. Um, I call them the Uber mention. It's a phrase taken from Nietzsche, which means that, like a mensch is like an honorable or a good human being. The Uber mensch is like the superhuman version. Um, this is all from Z Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And then I decided to take that group of people, and I have a few more like Newton, Da Vinci. Um, the list goes on, and then. I would study their primary works, um, like read first person, and then also their biographies, um, and kind of look for commonalities or patterns between them and try to adopt them into my own life. So if you, when you look back on this entrepreneurial schedule, right? Some people have a workout routine. They'll do you know 10 minutes of cardio, 10 minutes of – you had this entrepreneurial uh, workout regimen. Uh, what, looking back, was you think the most important? You know, it's always kind of like a 80-20 thing, right? What was most important for you out of the regimen? Um, I don't know. I think this might sound kind of lame, but I think it's really just consistency. Um, like most people just give up or stop at a certain point, and the will to keep going um, is really important. Um, and like it, that might sound like, oh, it's so obvious, but – a lot of people just flat out don't do yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious at the time, but looking back, sometimes it's not obvious as far as what kept well, you going, right? Because at this point, you're on Robbie's couch. You're seeing he's a professional volleyball player, and it's not necessarily easy to keep going. So what, what kept you going at the time? I don't know. Mm. I, I just – I don't know. Just, I think it's A just, lot of what I really love like, – I, yeah. like, I, I know. I mean, it was just like – it just had to happen. Like there was, yeah. I mean, Steve was on my couch um, from humble beginnings, you know, like it was, we just kind of both felt the place of just, we needed to pursue something great and make it work, you know? And like it, it was, there was like never an option. It was just like, we need to be the best. And we, we had both kind of learned how to learn at this point. And we learned how to master a skill. I think volleyball taught us a lot about mastering a skill, which is a really important concept to like really a grasp early in your life is like seeing something you can be good at something but then when you train against the best people in the world every day on a court you start to learn these crazy like intricacies of a game or a skill and then yeah. like the, the 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 difference between someone who's like a, a, a olympic class athlete versus professional versus college yeah it's very subtle you know it's not like anything crazy different everyone's jumping 45 inches everyone touches 12 it's feet mental it's a lot of mental and it's a lot of just like fine tuning and like really mastering something. So at that mm. point we knew we had to master new things and we were at, we were basically starting from scratch. Yeah. Like we didn't study business. We didn't really do anything. I had never done any branding or marketing or design. Steve had never done any finance or operations. So we just kind of started diving in and just trying to devour information that would lead us in the right direction in a way. Yeah. So Robbie, how do you mentally prepare, you know, a professional athlete? Like that's a good good distinction right when you get to a certain level there's a lot of talented people out there but what separates them is probably you know there's skill there's a work ethic and there's the mental piece totally. what do you do what did you do to prepare mentally when you're going up against you know some of the best people in the u.s maybe the world 
Yeah, first of all, like when you're playing against the best, you have to do your homework. I mean, you have to do your research, you got to do your research, got to watch them play, learn their tendencies. Every everyone has tendencies whether it's in life or business or sports. Like it's very, people are pretty predictable. Yeah. But the best people have a number of predictable talents that they won't always like for example, in volleyball like average players have 2 to 3 hits. Good players have 8 to 10. So like you got to really know the, your opponent. I'd say mm. too like Mentally, one of the biggest things I learned was um, from a book called Relentless by Tim Grover. Yeah, love that one, yeah. Amazing mindset book. And what I think one of the most important things I learned playing in Italy, too, is just when you're competing, you need to quiet your mind. Hmm. There, at a certain point, you've done all the preparation you can do. Um, overthinking is like your worst enemy in a lot of ways. When you're hmm. on the court or when you're in, the, you're in a meeting, right now on a podcast, you know, I'm not thinking about like, some crazy outside of the box thing or how I can do this. It's like, no, we're here having a conversation, like be in the moment, be present and really just kind of let all of your preparation speak for itself. Yeah. So when you let your, when you let your like, it's almost a subconscious thing. The brain, if you let your, the, my best ball I've ever played is when your brain stem takes over. You're in the match. It's almost like people call it like in the zone or like blacking out. Flow. It's like a flow yeah. state where everything kind of works and you're not thinking, you're just doing. And that's mm. like really where you, people perform their best. How do you get in the zone or flow? That's, that's a good question I, too. There's a lot of different ways. I think for me, a lot of it is honestly just the stage. Um, the higher the stage, the easier it is when you get in the zone. If you like, you, you come into a practice and you're just kind of, like dicking around and goofing off, you're never gonna find the zone. But if you like come to work and you come prepared to win, you're you're automatic. You're a good place. Some good music. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like, I totally agree about this like level of like kind of pressure or competition. And like, I've literally been getting in the flow state like almost every single day, uh, like multiple times per day sometimes. And literally, all you need to do is like. Rob mentioned it, but it is really subtle, but it's so important. It's like quieting your mind. And How like, do you do that? It's, it's hard to do with all the technology and everything going on. What do you do I, to quiet everything around you? I had some really weird habits like growing up, like before I would sleep, like that's how I fell asleep every night was I'd build like a, like a brick well around myself. Hmm. Um, Mentally. Then, You're just yeah. Getting... And then like after a while, like once the bricks are around, like fully surrounded, then I would just shut off hmm. and that was like just how did you come to that how did you even come to doing that i honestly don't it was probably something i read when i was a lot younger but mm. i mean like you can't sleep if your brain keep thinking about things so if you just stop thinking um then you can sleep i think but. it's interesting too like uh, i've done we've, we've both done a pretty good amount of yoga at this point and uh at ucla our coaching staff was really big on meditation and visual visualization yeah. So every day before practice, we all stand on the line, close our eyes, and our mm. coach would talk us through a deep breathing visualization exercise mm. where you would literally like, I mean, your your mirror neurons and like your motor cortex can actually like replicate and like per perform actions without even moving. I think visualization is an amazing opportunity that a lot of people know about or really take advantage of. Totally. Even for a, for a meeting or a speech or a game or like, Whatever you're doing, the night before, if you can walk through your head of what's going to happen <clears throat> and get, put yourself in the position of what you're going to see and feel and taste and touch, then you're way more prepared for the coming event or coming day and perform yeah. really well. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's overlooked visualization. Um, yeah. So talk you, about, Robbie, for a second. You're in a game. You're in a match, right? And you make a mistake. Like right. sometimes being in flow, being in zone, I feel for me or, or I've seen other people when they make a mistake, then they get in their own head, right? And they, like you said, the best thing is just to stop thinking and do. What do you do to get back into that state after you make a mistake? Cause it's so easy. You see someone who misses a few free throws and all of a sudden you're, you're just thinking, oh, I don't want to miss another free throw. And then you that causes you to miss more free throws, right? Or whatever, whatever yeah. sport. So. Yeah. I think like the biggest thing in that point is, is like as, as soon as you recognize that you missed and it was a problem, you're already in the wrong place. Like it's just a probability game. A lot of points. Like I mean, free throw wise, Steph Curry is gonna probably make 19 out of 20 shots, but he knows every 20 is gonna miss one. In a lot of ways, you know, like it's not like a oh crap, I missed this free throw. It's like it happened, you know. Like I'm gonna hit the next one. So you yeah. learn to shrug things off. Go ahead. 
Stay in the moment. I mean, that's the easiest way to think about it. Anytime you get out of that moment, you get out of flow. I'm just wondering what your guys' reframe is in your mind, right? Sure. I'd so, say like for a lot in volleyball, it was always like this point, like one point. Like all of life and games and sports are a series of events and series of points, and you can't you you can't replay the last point and you can't play in advance the next point. All you can do is work on the one point you're currently working on. If you win more points than the other team, like individual subunits of a game, then you're gonna win the match. So you your lose- reframe is whatever happens, you're just like okay, focus on this. Focus on the next point. One point. Just like win the next point. Like this point is all that matters. And you can really, yeah, it's about being moment in the, in the present moment and just like blocking out what happened because it's like it's a really huge problem to think and like live in the past because the past is already gone. You know, you can't change it no matter how bad it was. Like I've done some really dumb things on the court, you know. Like you look really stupid sometimes, especially in volleyball. Or in basketball or in life, you know? But Same if you're in business. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking backward and going like, oh man, four days later, how did I do that? What was I thinking? And you're in the wrong place, you know? You're not in the present moment. You're not looking at the next point. And it's okay to be in the moment about your past too, to reflect on what you've done and figure out, hey, why this happened? I want to improve. Maybe, like, maybe I need to do this a little bit better or that. But like, that's still in the moment. You're still thinking about that. Yeah, you're learning from the past instead of <coughs> instead of like, yeah. So Steve, you're at this point you're still on Robbie's couch. So t- how do you get to Tenzo T? Well, I'm gonna say I was just reading on my computer. I uh, discovered matcha, and then kind of like a whole series of things like fell into place, all very like kind of at the same time. So like I mentioned, Rob mentioned this like why did we start Tenzo, and it's like matcha is a very positive thing it will has a lot of health benefits it's got the highest amount of antioxidants per gram it's a much cleaner and healthier way to have energy um so that was like a good thing because we're giving value to the world number one boom next thing the experience from kotu i looked on google trends and matcha was trending far into the right it's growing at 25 percent a year compounding uh, the market size in the u.s have the world working in your favor check from Flux Chargers, you know, we had a new customer every time. With matcha, it can be a daily habit. Someone can drink it every day and keep buying. Track number three. Next thing, didn't have to just sell online. You could sell the wholesale shops. You can sell the corporations. Um, there's a lot of ways to use it in pies, smoothies, cakes, cookies. Um, track number four, big market, and it's going to grow a lot. Um, and kind of all these things really happened, and it wasn't like one – aha, like this is the moment, like this is it. It was more like a grow with the product, drink it more and more, get to like it, and really kind of embody the spirit of what it means to be a Tenzo and, and then take it from there. So then you just you say, okay, this is a good market. This is kind of embodies our values. Yeah. Um, what do you do next? I think I was doing some research, and oftentimes we overcomplicate this. It sounded like you just Googled something. Yeah, yeah, literally, that was it. Um, like, <clears throat> that's how I found Matcha. It was, I was actually just reading blogs about, like, how to build websites better. And then, like, someone was like, here's how you build a site. And the example was, like, a tea site, and I found Matcha. You know, and, and then, like, how did we find the product or, like, get started? Like, we went on Shopify, like, bought, like, a $5, like, hosting through Shopify, and, like, Googled, like, where to buy Matcha, this time I computed one Saturday and it went through like four pages of Google for matcha and just got samples from everybody. Yeah, it was, it was honestly like a, we call it like a weekend project at the time. It's funny. Um, I don't know if you've, there's a book by Richard Koch, uh, The Star Principle. And what you're describing sounds, there's a lot of similarities to like how he, you know, invested whatever. I don't remember his investments, but most people would get three out of 10 and his were six out of 10 as far as people just taking off in in value. And it's your thought process sounds very similar to how he chooses a star company to invest in actually. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Check it out. You'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, See, so Okay, so you decide. Okay, th- at this point, are you excited to find to move? Are you antsy at all? Like, I'm actually getting nervous hearing this story. Like, you're doing this regimen. I would just at some point be like, 
okay, just give me an idea, something that I can actually start executing on. <clears throat> At this point, were you, okay, I'm going full force on this, or are you still exploring other things? Uh, no. A little, a little bit of a mix. I think like yeah. once we try, once we'd really like known we liked matcha and everything, we kind of like were pretty much just You're full, in. just like horse blinders. Like okay, let's go, you know. But well, at the same time, it wasn't like, it was like launching just, into a big, massive company we are today. We started very simple. I mean, we got a co-packer to make us samples, and we gave it to our friends to see they thought about it. Yeah, I mean, Rob still was playing professional volleyball until last May, May of 2017. Yeah, so, like he he was still part time. I was doing it a lot of my time, but I was still spending considerable amounts just like learning basics um, and trying to get those down and then like slowly figuring it out. But I mean, I was still on the couch. Um, we were making websites. We had this company called Iliad Tech where we would build websites for influencers. Um, we made like five to 10 websites, nothing crazy. But it taught us a lot about like programming, getting a client, web design, things like that. So, were you worried at all with matcha as far as um, being a single ingredient type of product? Mm. In a lot of ways, it's really good. So, I mean, looking back on our first two years, I'm, I'm so happy we chose such a simple product. Um, and just in terms of what it is itself, it's like a good base for a lot of things. And it's not too specific. It's like really widely usable. It's technically non-perishable. You don't have to store it in like yeah. refrigeration. So that's good. I mean, from a distribution and storage side, it saves a lot of costs and a lot of effort. Talk <clears> about, because um, like you were saying before, you have interesting ways of thinking about how you can get it to market, right? Talk about what you're thinking as far as online strategies versus the offline strategy. Because at the front of the interview, I said not on Amazon. So right. talk about the decision to not be on Amazon. So, Rob, feel free to jump in. But the, basically the, the impetus for starting online was that you would get feedback a lot faster and you have a direct interaction with your customers. Um, so... One of the interesting conversations we had um, like right after our first year was with uh, Coca-Cola venturing and emerging brands. And I asked them, what is one indicator that makes a successful food and beverage company? And they said, in the first year, this company will iterate their packaging between five and 10 times. Hmm. And I was like, oh, great, we did that. That's perfect. You know, and like, it may seem subtle to us and like people may think, oh, you're spending all this time iterating packaging, yada, yada, yada. But it was more like a, Let's improve really fast based on a lot of feedback that we're getting from our customers. And if you're selling, let's say, in Whole Foods on retail shelves as like a bottled drink, you don't get the feedback from the customers because you don't have the interaction with them. And the same thing on Amazon. Amazon owns all that data. You don't get email addresses. You can't ask your, ask your customers for feedback um, outside of their review process. So we wanted to own the relationship with our customers to build the trust. And we also wanted to be able to iterate quickly. So talk about the changes in packaging. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it at first was like... I'm looking at it right now. That's why you see me looking at another screen with your website up over here. So it's not me. It's not me. Our next production run as well, even better packaging. But we started off really simple. We started off with um, a private labeler out of Arizona. We, he, would, uh, he would package our tea for us and he put stickers on our bag. So stickers were honestly a blessing because... We could just print new stickers and everyone had changed the bag. You know, the stickers got slapped on there. Wasn't too official. Wasn't ready for retail shelves by any means, but definitely allowed us to make some quick changes. So we started off, I mean, I was just learning graphic design at this point. So a lot of the design changes were just like really blatant flaws in graphic design and typography. Those were simple ones. Other ones were more about like the writing, like how the, the descriptions of how to make um, serving size. Like we didn't really understand fully, like even the ingredient section, like how to properly address FDA regulations. We were kind of like learning and testing, but we kind of, it was great to just start because it gave us a good point to iterate on. One of our biggest things was always just like, do it to the best of your ability, circle back, make it better, make it better, make it better. Um, and it's still a process. We're still getting better with it. I think we still need to do a better job of just like how to make it, you know, like, it's a, it's a really, it's a great product, really easy to make if you describe it the right way. If, uh, if you don't, then it's just like, oh shoot. So how'd you come up with the name Tenzo? 
Another great question. Um, a Tenzo is one of the seven paths to enlightenment in a Buddhist monastery. Hmm. It's, um, it's the monk that takes donations from the people and provides spiritual holy meals for the meditating monks. And the direct translation is um, Heavenly Monk in Japanese. So, you, so yeah. I was so it kind of sense in terms of like Japanese roots of a product, has some meme behind it. Really like the Tenzo T, just sounded kind of nice, a uh, alliteration there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of like so, Steve, you were saying so Amazon owns the customer. So you're like, we want direct feedback. So, what do you do then? Because Amazon's obviously a big channel. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this is a hotly debated topic um, among our company, and we asked a lot of people for advice. Yeah, uh, but we were lucky enough to speak with VMG, which is the premier CPG investment firm in the U.S., and their founding partner recommended that um, brands stay away. Uh, if you want to build an iconic food and beverage brand, you should stay away from Amazon in the beginning until you have a very strong sense of customer and a very strong brand. Um, otherwise, you'll get eaten by Amazon. So kind of our goal was to build that very large, high impact, long lasting company. Um, so we stayed away. So talk about then, because there's two then, wholesale, you're going direct to companies, and then there's the retailers you're going, obviously, Ezra helps with getting direct to consumer. Yep. So the wholesale, <coughs> um, <coughs> which actually really is really special about this. Um, and I'm kind of hesitant to even say it, but it's very Well, important. I don't edit anything. So if, if you... Yeah, well, it's okay. It's just a little okay. bit of strategy. No, okay. This is like important stuff here. But um, wholesale allows us to scale the brand much, much faster, um, meaning that instead of having one brick-and-mortar location that maybe serves one to two to 300 cups a day, we have 130 locations that all serve 50 to 75 cups a day. Yeah. Um, so if you do that math there, it's not even close. Um, you put the brand out in front in each of those locations, um, that's like X number more people per day that see and get to know your brand. Totally. So it's a, a much faster way to expand the kind of the brand name. And is it is it just because your relentless athletic background allows you to get into some of these? <laughs> you know? <laughs> The relentless mindset uh, yeah. allows us to get in. Yeah, I mean, that is like one of the things that... Because I'm sure they have a lot of very matcha, not just matcha, but every company is probably trying to get in to have them use their product, right? So yeah. I can't imagine it being easy. Uh, it was definitely a long time in the works. We started, we um, were living in Long Beach when Steve's on my couch. It uh, just so happened that one of the highest volume shops in all of L.A., was about stone throw away from our house. Mm. So we worked there almost every day. We got to know everyone in the store. We met the okay. We eventually pitched to them, and she was like, "Oh man, like, no, no." <laughs> <laughs> so well, I, we, we did it again, and we went back the next day, and we kept going back and back and back and back and back and back and back. And we were friends with the Breeses, and we knew their kids. And when they went out, of, like what they were doing in school that week, like we we were very intimate. Um, got the first location. And then just kept what leveraging up. the no to a yes? What do you think was one of the main things over time? There was a, there's, a, some, there's some point where you, right. obviously you get to know them. And every, there's some point where the, that no goes to a yes. What do you think that, that turning point was? I think was? it was just an information flow. Um, well, like, obviously, it may not seem like this now, but when we first started, there's, like, this inherent gap between, like, Rob and I, and then like being able to like run a successful business. Um, they didn't really know that. And the owner had like a lot of experience with matcha. She'd been to Japan and done the whole tea ceremony. And she's like, why are these two random athletes trying to start a matcha tea company? And they're absolutely right. They're not in the industry. They've never done it at any other locations before. Um, so really getting that first one is like really the hardest and it kind of spirals down from there. So you had to prove it. It's yeah, also to cool it. too because uh, Portfolio Coffee House is the place we're talking about is they have a lot of like just rain in the area. Like people know the name, they recognize them. So I think it's kind of like it's kind of an Uber strategy. You take over the big cities first, or you take over the big places first, and then you can fill in. You can leverage the high volume, high known place for the, the smaller guys. The, totally the around it in a way. Totally. So, and um, what about I mean, the online compete? What's that? 
Yeah, I was say within like eight months, we we like just dominated most of Long Beach. We had like 20, 25 shops. Just in Long Beach, the just brand was Beach. built. Um, that was, we we, that was we would walk around. It was hilarious. Like people call us like the Macho Men. We were just so tall and just crazy. Oh, the Tenzo Boys. Oh, the Macho here. Like it's an advantage. Like, I mean, I think it's a it's a serious advantage. You walk into a store, you have someone who's seven feet and six six. It's it's. You know, you stick out in, in not a bad way. No, it's, no, a, yeah, it's, it's the greatest thing. Rob, everyone remembers Rob, no matter where we go. Like at Expo West a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, you can look up and see see Rob. Like, oh yeah, there he is. No, but he he wasn't there. He went the year before, and everyone was like, "Where's the seven footer?" Because <laughs> they all remembered that I was with this guy. It's so funny. It's classic. And for a long time, I always thought like, oh, like. I need to play a sport. Like, what am I going to do without athletics? Like, I'm no one. I'm all, all this hype for no reason, you know? But really learn to just, like, whatever makes you different is, like, what makes you special. Yeah. And you have to really embrace that. It's such a positive. Like, it's huge. It's been such a blessing just even in networking events and just, like, business and meeting people. It's, like, really cool just to be yourself and, like, use it to your advantage. I think, you know, Rob, um, talk about the decision to – I mean, it's your whole – I'm mean, going to say your whole identity, but oftentimes we do it to ourselves. We create this identity around, for you, I'm sure you've been playing volleyball for for years, and you have this identity, especially as a pro athlete. How was that transition from, because you transitioned, you were doing full-time pro to the company? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, like, I mean, for a long time, I really felt, like you said, my whole identity was athletics. I spent my whole life training for the next step and keep working up the ladder and work toward the Olympics. Um, for me, though, too, it's like it was almost it was a, it was a building step. It wasn't quite like changing. It was more like, boom, like I'm taking a break from the sport to do this, you know? And you can really leverage it. It's kind of more leveraging. You're not saying like, oh, I'm quitting. I'm done forever. It's like, no, I'm taking a break to do this. And then you can like, you don't ever take a step back. And I kind of, I saw a lot of connections in the game and in the sport. And uh, I've tried to really maintain relationships. So I wouldn't say like I completely shift identities, but I've kind of been focusing on other things for the last two years. So that helps answer the question. Yeah, at what point do you decide, and, and Steve, probably, or you're probably like, yeah, I just, I want you full time at this thing, you know, um, no. I was trying to come full time for so long. Right. Yeah. So it was hard. I mean, it was a really tough. It was a really hard decision because, like, I mean, when I stopped playing volleyball officially, I was training three times a week with all our top Olympians, like, um, right in the works, getting really good, had great opportunities there. But it was really like kind of the long term investment, which I didn't see being like all the way like put together. It didn't make a ton of sense mm. and, like a lot of my bigger life goals to keep pursuing volleyball. And whatever what we we st we started the Tenzo, it was starting to make a lot of sense, you know. It was really starting to gain traction and I realized my time would be much better spent in terms of just like long-term growth in my own self mm -hmm. working on Tenzo. At what point do you decide to switch? Is it okay when we get this amount of traction um how do you flip that switch? Or maybe, you know, Steve, I don't know, from outside looking at him, what what did you see kind of pushing him over the edge? Okay, like now's the time. Well, from an outside perspective, and this I'm not trying to be rude, but it was honestly the volleyball professional leagues in America are incredibly unorganized. They don't support their players, and they're really honestly pretty selfish. Um and mainly just selfish in their thinking, meaning they do not make the correct decisions for the good of the volleyball community in the U.S. So more or less, there was I was I was on the fence doing like 60, 40, Tenzo, and then there was this massive contract that made everyone sign a big four-year deal, exclusive rights, really just destroyed the players, and it was a it was a terrible deal. So, um, so I just I didn't sign it. I stopped on the mm. spot. Just like nope. We were trying to negotiate. The AVP just said no negotiation is going to happen. We're not going to do anything about this. And from that point, it was it was very clear to me. Like I, I've always, like I said before, I kind of I love intuition in life, and you kind of like play through yeah. life and opportunities. A lot of things just make sense. It's like boom, like they kind of push you to make a decision. And luckily, you had a fallback 
I'm sure yeah. not everyone has a fallback. They're like, well, what else am I going to do? And they sign it and then just keep going. Exactly. exactly. That's what a lot of people that's, did. That's a very sad decision, though. But. So, Steve, talk about the – now, The you talked about the offline, the wholesale. Most people you know, go direct to consumer. How do you decide to get the word out online as much as possible with direct feedback? Yeah. Um, well, How would you find Azrael? Oh, yeah. So that's actually – this is all great. This is, that's a, this is a great question. Um, so around um, – I had been actually reading a book about Ben Franklin – and I was learning about building a community. And so I started going to like the Long Beach City Council meetings and kind of meetups for local officials. I met this guy there who is a really good Facebook ads. And he's like, you need to get in these groups, um, the Facebook groups. Like there's like these kind of like secret entrepreneurial societies on Facebook with like a few hundred people. And everyone's like very helpful and collaborative. So we got in these groups, learned about Facebook ads, and then just started kind of putting money into Facebook ads and it's like a vending machine and drives a lot of traffic. Um, and that like, that was pretty much it. It wasn't sometimes anything. Facebook ads are vending machine. You put money in, you don't get anything out though. Yeah. Sometimes, but yeah. you know, <laughs> you're okay. So how'd you meet Azrael though? Through these communities? Yeah. Through the groups. Um, he's pretty well spoken there. He's like, um, kind of thought of as like the go-to guy, um, for Facebook ads and kind of any questions or, advice and he did some mentoring for us on how to build like good funnels, um, how to reduce your, your CAC um, and kind of get more clicks and people to your website. So what's some good advice you that he's given you? Um, I mean, um, it's a lot of things, everything. It's like websites are honestly, it's like a big math equation of just traffic times conversion rate times cart size. Yeah. I think, and I, yeah, just to say something that, um, Avery is what I call him, but one thing that Avery um, said was, and one thing he does extremely well, and it's awesome to hear him talk through this, is as you go through your funnel, you always want to reframe each step from the consumer's uh, kind of viewpoint and say, what does a consumer know at this stage? How do we tailor the information at this part of the funnel to what they know? And then just goes all the way down the pipeline from cold lead all the way to buying customer. Love it. And um, content strategies, right? You guys have produced some videos. You guys have some really nice images. How do you educate? You know, we were talking before we hit record on the information gap. There's a big information gap with matcha. Some people don't know what it is. Some people don't know what the benefits are. Some people are like, is matcha the same as, you know, a green tea powder? How do you close the information gap? What are some of the things people should know about the product? Sure, a couple of things come to mind. First of all, like in terms of marketing and stuff, it's always great to be first. Um, it's a really big psychological principle to be the first in the consumer's mind. So in a lot of ways, it's a large advantage if you can solve the information gap properly. Uh, matcha is a powder green tea. It's originally from Japan. It's been grown and cultivated there for like a thousand years. Use meditation practice for a calm, focused energy. It's different than regular green tea because instead of using a tea bag to steep it, you dissolve it directly into your drink by whisking, shaking, blending. Yeah, uh, It's just powder green tea, really fine powder green tea from the nutrient-rich baby green tea leaves. So. Yeah. I was watching a video about some of your products and I was looking on your, your page and there, I didn't realize there's like a bamboo matcha whisk, yeah. right? And that you need this whisk and I got in and I started watching the video that you need this whisk to make sure like that fine powder gets mixed in with the, with the drink, right? Yeah, bamboo is the best um, possible mixing device. Like it's a, uh, those are all handmade. They're like 120 prong whisks. Uh, the bamboo is flexible enough that it like really moves well in water and it really kind of gives you a nice, nice frothy finish. It's awesome, yeah. And yeah. Um, benefits, so what most people don't know. Yeah, we gotta kind of be careful what we say here uh, with the FDA and stuff, but we could say supports, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, so it has a lot of antioxidants which help fight free radicals. Um, free radicals are notorious for um, being related to um, like types of cancer or neurodegenerative damage, um, and so they help really just antioxidants help fight that and keep your body and brain, heart clear um, and healthy. Um, it's also got caffeine, obviously, so it's like a cup of coffee, but 
but instead of the roller coaster up down, it provides a very stable, clean focus that lasts four to six hours, hmm. um, which is really nice because no jitters, no crash. Um, There's also a, a rare amino acid in green tea, and specifically in matcha, it's been much higher concentrations, called L-theanine, which produces like alpha waves in the brain, which are said to be the meditative state of mind. So it, matcha is really interesting in terms of the energy boost because it's a very calm and focused energy versus a crazy, jittery, spiky, hmm. feel crazy energy. Yeah. Uh, the L-theanine and caffeine pair very nicely to give you this kind of relaxed, focused, and energized state all at the same time. So how is matcha used? How do people use it? What's their common uses? I, I think... Do people ever use it when they're making kombucha, like kombucha, like matcha flavored kombucha or anything, or not really? Not really. Because from what you're saying, it's like there's some like <clears throat> steady caffeine in it, it as a nice flavor. It gives a green flavor. It makes me think as I brew my own kombucha, so I'm like, I should get this and sprinkle, yeah. com- you know, probably, the matcha in it. If you haven't tried it. That's probably an amazing additive. Uh, typically, we do a lot of just plain tenzo tea, which is just like matcha and water. You can put it over ice, so you can make it hot. Mm-hmm. Uh, tenzo latte with some milk. You can also like put it milk. in like a shaker bottle. So our water bottle here, put some matcha in. It has a little kind of like I just agitator, and then <laughs> shake it up. Um, you're good to go. Super simple. Other or, things too. We have uh, yeah. Yeah, like a nice little bowl. Put in two ounces of water, a scoop of matcha. Use the bamboo whisk to whisk it up. And then pour over more water or milk, and you have a nice latte. Those are probably the most common two ways. Um, some people also cook with that, use it as a food coloring, uh, healthy food coloring, or you can put it in smoothies and things like that. In addition to, we have a couple of really fun wholesale sh- places that serve our tea. They make matcha pies, matcha ice cream, mm. matcha donuts, um, list kind of matcha chocolate. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So like matcha can be used almost anywhere and everywhere. Which is amazing. Yeah, I like it as far as, you know, I make a lot of smoothies just to, if you want a nice, like, green coloring. I mean, obviously, there's health benefits, too. Um, yeah, that's, love it. Um, what's the future, what do you think the future is? Um, right now, do you have a bag or do you have something you could show as far as what, what it looks like? <laughs> yeah, so we have these bags, 30 gram bags, um, and we also have a size bigger. Um, in the future, I mean, we don't want to do anything crazy, and we started with the powder just to kind of do that really, really well. Um, and our kind of our game plan is just to grow the sales, optimize revenue, um, especially in a local area, yeah, uh, specifically in LA, and then try to just keep learning, um, seeing how we can take it bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, the advantages and disadvantages of something like that, it, that you can use it for so many things, is you can use it for so many things. And you could do so many things with it, right? Like you're thinking, oh, like, we could just not do I mean, my ADD mind goes, now we have the powder. We could make this powder into capsules or make, you know, it's got health meds or make this powder into some product uh, that actually is a done, uh, someone could buy and consume. Any thoughts on that? Or you're like, no, we're just sticking right now to the course. That's definitely uh, in the vision. The plan, though, is we got to get a lot better at what we're doing currently. and cut. We want to scale this a lot more first so we can have more capital and more resources to be able to do a lot more things well. Yeah. I think it's really important to start simple. Like That's a really good point you brought up that there are a million things you can do, but if you try to do a million things at once, you end up doing nothing. Nothing so, well. Nothing well, you could say, yeah. So I guess in terms of our... Our timeline, we're looking at powdered first, um, maybe make some flavors, healthy flavors with, it, with the powder as a base, move into RTDs, ready to drinks, energy shots. Um, yeah. That direction, you know. So I always ask this guy, first of all, thank you both. This has been fantastic. Everyone should go oh, to ten, tenzot.co and check it out um, or support it wherever it is in, in California, probably growing in other places across the U.S., um, I always ask two things. One, what's been a low point, challenging, and then two, on the flip side, what's been a high point or proud moment with Tenzo T. <laughs> so maybe each of you have different low points, big challenges. What's been a low point um, in the business? Mine's pretty simple. I mean, 
hardest thing that I ever did, um, we ever did was raise seed, raise our seed round was first like legitimate fundraising for a large dollar value. Um, lowest point was about like any minute right before we actually got the money. And then highest point was when we got the money. You bring a good point up actually, cause I had it in my notes and I didn't ask it is, um, bootstrapping versus getting funding. So what made you decide to get funding? Um, kind of Rob hinted at this point that's very important, um, especially in an emerging market is to be first. And so we wanted to raise money to grow faster. Um, how, how difficult was it? Uh, extreme, I mean, extremely. Um, first time raising a serious amount of money was really hard. I had to learn so much. Um, and like I said, learn it really, really well. And that was kind of really the hardest part. And also like not knowing because you're making all these bets um, that your company's going to grow and that you're going to move into an office and you're going to hire all these people and you're telling all these people all these things and you don't really know. Um, yeah. it's, just, it's extremely stressful. How do you, at that point, where, where's the, where are you at with the company when, you, when you're raising money? At this point, you're already going, you're already selling? Yeah, we grew extremely fast through quarter four 2017. Um, like 50 to 100 X growth in revenue every single month. Um, that puts us in a pretty good spot to raise more money, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So who do yeah. you hire? Um, I think um, revenue generation was key. So we hired two people, three people to generate revenue, and then uh, one more person to help me on the op side and support that. So, uh, Rob, I want to get to your low point, but uh, Steve, so what are you feeling until you get that investment? It seems like you guys are doing well, right? So why is it a low point before you're getting funding? Yeah, I mean, honestly, we just like, it was all about the bets and the risks. And like, it's very, it was very, I felt very awkward telling people things that I wasn't actually sure of. Um, and like, so I just didn't know. And that, it was honestly just kind of scary. Um we weren't profitable. I mean, we were burning a lot of money and we had hired these people before we actually got the money. So we were burning cash and it was just like a, oh my gosh, like if we do not get this uh, in this actually by this day, like we yeah. will die. It's tough with the physical product because the more you're selling, the more you have to invest in more product, right? Yep. Yep. So cash flow is like a big thing. Yeah. Um, you can overcome that with credit lines and good, uh, good investors. Yeah. Rob, what about you? What was yeah, a low I've been, point? I've been thinking about it last like thirty seconds. I think very generally speaking, like I have a very short term memory for unfortunate events and bad things, which is a blessing. It's good and volleyball and in business, I guess. Yeah, right? exactly. But I'd say like I wouldn't pinpoint any specific like low point. I feel like the entire stretch has been a roller coaster, no doubt. And it's kind of always about like dealing with the lows and getting to the highs again and uh I think it, a lot of the toughest things we've really encountered or letting employees go is never fun. Like, I mean, not letting go, just parting ways. You know, it's always in the best interest of the company. It's always about doing things for the company. And when you kind of put it in your mind like that, it makes everything a lot easier. Um, I just think like there's been a lot of, you just a lot of unknown and the unknown is definitely a low point at some times because you, you there's like days when you just really don't sleep because you just you're waiting for things to play out and those are like i wouldn't call them low points but they're just kind of like oh no like we gotta just be patient you gotta just wait you gotta like yeah. take your mind off stuff ben horowitz calls it the struggle um, which i'd highly recommend reading for any entrepreneurs listening um it's very true to kind of what we're dealing with and going through is that Great. his book, um, Hard Things About Hard Things, or, is it, or is he, does he have another one? It's in that book. Oh, it's in well. that book. Okay. You just if you Google that's a fantastic book. Yeah. Fantastic. If you Google The Struggle by Ben Horowitz, um, I honestly highly recommend every entrepreneur reads that and just gets comfortable that knowing you're going to go through that. Yes. Yes. Which, sorrow too is another great. Um, like principle, which I learned, we learned at a, That's a Y Combinator, we have a y Combinator uh, meetup. <coughs> it talks a lot about how, like, when you first start a business, you kind of have all this initial traction. People love your product; it's going great, and then you enter the trough of sorrow. You just stay there for an indefinite amount of time. You know, like I feel like we're just starting to climb out of it right now, but it took us like twelve months of just knocking on doors, getting told no a million times, having only your grandma buy things online. You know, and like. 
not getting actual any customers. Like it just like, is this going to work? And those are like really uncomfortable places to be, but you got to just believe in your underlying self and your goal and your mission and just let it all go, you know, just work on what's next. So Steve proud moment, big milestone that you're like, finally I'm off the couch with an actual, with the company. Well, I think honestly, one of them could be just when I got my own bed. <laughs> when I had a bed. At what uh, point do you get your own? Decide to get your own bed. Like what point in the thing. company? Oh, uh, we are still very young. I mean, we were paying ourselves like pretty much nothing, like just to pay rent, and so I could buy a bed essentially, and eat. But I think also like moving up out of Long Beach into Los Angeles was a big moment in my life. I mean, I had never had my own bedroom, um, so it's really cool to finally now I have my own bedroom with a bed, um, and that was cool. But I mean, also, there's so many, like Rob said, it's kind of like a roller coaster, right? We moved into a very cool office. It's nice to, like, have that sense of responsibility and kind of be able to, like, look at something like, yeah, we have this, we built this. Um, it's pretty cool. I'd say proud moment for me was just when the first people believed in our mission and joined our team. Um, like, Brody was a very early adopter. Like, he came <laughs> in, he saw what we were doing, he saw how just, like, I don't know, you believed in what we were doing. That's a really empowering feeling, just knowing that, like, you're crazy, but you're not that crazy, you know? Like, people, it's like it's possible to buy in. We, I think we built, it was really cool to see kind of the culture and the mission we built and, like, how people, like, our current team is all so gung-ho and on board to dominate and excel. It's, like, a really powerful and amazing feeling. Guys, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been fantastic. I loved hearing about all the, the different journeys. Everyone should check out tenzot.co. Anywhere else, we should point people online to check you guys out. Yeah, we're on Instagram, at tenzot. Uh, we're building a Facebook group. We're launching that kind of thing soon. So we'll be uh, bigger check, presence yeah, there. Instagram, website, you're good to go. All right, cool. Sweet. Check it out. Get the powerful effects of... Tenzo T's matcha. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Thanks so much Thanks for having us. us. It's been a great, it's been amazing. Cheers. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.